On Thanksgiving weekend of 1950, a brutally frigid nor'easter storm was battering the coast of Massachusetts, and was particularly harsh on the small town of Marblehead near Salem. Barrow Atherton, a 47-year-old elementary school teacher had 25 years of service under her belt, and was home alone with her dog Esky. A white spitz who was her constant companion, since the death of her father, that Ski was about the only companion she ever kept. And Atherton was a self-described spinster with no close friends or family. It is said that her favorite pastimes was watching old movies, and she would drive to the movie theater and Linda catch a show, but always went alone. With the freezing winds lashing at her drab clabbered cottage on Sewell Street and Beryl ran a few final errands before her small town was due to be snowed under. She made a run to the grocery store to pick up vital supplies, including a few extra cans of food for ASCII, before she took a few bags of garbage out to the trash cans outside her home at around 6 p.m. that Saturday evening. When she did so, she spotted a young neighbor boy watching her from a window of his home. She gave the boy a wave and this was the last time she was seen for a good few days. As predicted, Marblehead was completely snowed under through the course of Thanksgiving weekend, and it took until Monday, November 27. For the town to dig itself out and resume normal activities. The town's milkman, known among the locals simply as Pint, called on Miss Atherton's home to deliver her milk. Usually speaking Pint would just leave a person's milk delivery on their doorstep. But he knew that Miss Atherton was extremely thin and frail at barely 100 pounds, and was concerned about her well-being after such a vicious snowstorm. So on this occasion, he actually knocked on Miss Atherton's door to ensure that she was okay. He knocked once, but there was no answer, then again, but there was still no answer. When a hunch, Pine tried the door handle and found that it was a marked, he wandered slowly through Miss Atherton's home at first, calling her name then walked into the kitchen, finding a scene that would take his breath away. Miss Atherton was lying on the floor, face up in a pool of her own clotted blood, with S.I. lying near her body, mewling, and a considerable amount of pain. Point screamed as he fled the house, careening to the home of one of Miss Atherton's neighbors and pleading with them to call the police. When the police arrived, they deduced that Barrow Atherton had been dead for days. On the kitchen tables were her brown paper of grocery bags, still full of food stuff she'd brought home when the last day she'd been seen alive by the curious neighbor boy, meaning that it had been only moments after this encounter, that her murderer had pounced, and within maybe an hour of waving to the small boy, Barrow Atherton was lying in a pool of her own blood. She had several broken ribs and bruising around her throat where she appeared to have been strangled, strangled so hard that there was still fingernail imprints in her cold dead flesh. Her killer had then used a small blade to slice her throat, but had done so in a very peculiar manner. Not only had he cut her neck open horizontally, but had also inflicted the dreadful vertical wound from her ribs to her chin, essentially stabbing a cross in her neck. The cuts are so deep that Barrow Atherton had almost been decapitated, and she had bled so heavily from her wounds that her blood vessels were completely sanguine. Aided, a sample would have to be extracted directly from her heart by the examining coroner. The killer then let himself out of the house, but not before breaking several of little Esky's ribs as the loyal hound tried to avenge his fallen mistress infuriatingly the crime scene was almost completely devoid of any clue as to the identity of Barrow's murderer. There wasn't a single sign of forced entry, anywhere on the property that were no fingerprints on any surface, and no shoe or boot prints on the ground surrounding the house. And despite questioning Barrow's neighbors, no one but the dog Esky had seen the killer in the flesh. If Miss Atherton cried out for help, the severity of the storm would probably have drowned out any urgent pleas of that fateful night. No one in the surrounding neighborhood had heard or seen a thing. Due, despite the grotesque violence of the scene, there appeared to be few signs of a struggle apart from a broken necklace caused by the impact of the killer's blade, which had also broken during the savage and unprovoked attack. And aside from a few broken fingers that suggested she had tried and failed to defend herself from her attacker, it seemed that he had managed to sneak up on Beryl while she was totally unaware. 
The crime scene was so lacking in useful evidence that it had been theorized the killer actually hung around for a little while ensuring there were no fingerprints, fibers, or DNA present. And since the murder took place in Beryl's kitchen, the killer may well have had ample access to cleaning supplies in order to ensure the scene was scrubbed of evidence. Both police and friends were surprised by the fact Miss Atherton kept a diary which yielded information about a handful of male acquaintances. Those that knew her were completely unaware of such gentlemen. But the information therein offered no help in solving the crime. It was discovered she had been deeply disappointed over a broken love affair, but this proved not to enter into the case either. In the aftermath of Barrow's murder, with police unable to come up with any suspects or clear motives for her killing. In the small town of Marblehead became rife with rumors and gossip. Some said Barrow was leading some kind of double life and had become embroiled with organized crime down in Boston that had come back to bite her. Others believe it was a jilted lover from the broken love affair that had sought revenge after Barrow had broken the engagement off or perhaps a relative who learned the sizable inheritance that they either wished to access early, or about to be cut off from. Yet her estate only consists of about $25,000, and no jewelry or other items appear to have been stolen from the house. So it seems that financial gain may not have been the motive. But chillingly enough, there are some living in Marblehead today who claim they know full well who killed Beryl and a handful who assert that the killer is still alive. Given that the killer might well be up to 80 or 90 years old, it's more than likely they might pass away before ever facing any charges for the murder they committed. And so it seems that the brutal crime committed that Thanksgiving weekend may forever remain unsolved. And they've yet another cold and callous murderer will escape justice, free to walk the streets and the knowledge they committed the worst act a person is capable of and gotten away with it. Martha Jean Lambert was born on March 26, 1973, to Howard and Margaret Lambert in St. Augustine Beach, Florida. Martha Jean was an extremely popular young lady among her peers, and greatly enjoyed spending quality time with her many friends and family members. Those that knew her often described her as kind and shy, saying she had a generally happy demeanor. But despite this, her home life was not great. Her father Howard was an abusive, raging alcoholic with a fierce and volatile temper. And her mother Margaret could often be heard arguing with him when he came home drunk from various bars around St. Augustine. As a result of this highly unstable and distressing relationship between her parents, Martha and her two older brothers were often cared for in various foster homes, which had a highly negative impact on their academic performance. Yet, in spite of such difficulties, Martha was known for being something of a tough cookie, and she didn't let it get her down too much, maintaining a positive attitude whenever she was at school. In 1985, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving was a day much like any other for young Martha. She spent the day attending her usual classes at school. And then when it was over, she went over to a friend's house to hang out until around 730. That evening, when she began the short walk back to her parents' trailer. Only that much is certain about what happened that evening. Afterwards, things began to get very unclear, indeed, and mainly due to conflicting accounts given by her very own family members. What we do know for definite is that it wasn't until 3 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day that Martha was actually reported missing. Her family told the police that she was a 12-year-old white girl with sandy blonde hair and bright blue eyes, standing at roughly 4 feet and 5 inches tall and weighing just shy of 70 pounds. She was also described as having birthmarks on both her upper left chest as well as on the front of her right thigh. Last her parents had seen of her she had been wearing a short sleeve summer dress. Given her age and inherent vulnerability, the cops started intense search for Martha as soon as the missing person's report came in. They initially focused their search around the area near to State Road to a 7, a stretch of four-lane highway that ran through northeastern Florida. They also scoured areas around Carrie Lynn Road, the place that Martha and her family called home he had despite their efforts, now the single trace of Martha Jean could be found. And to the heartbreaking disappointment of her family. The trail soon ran cold. Strangely enough, from the very moment she realized her daughter was missing, 
Martha's mother insisted that her daughter had been kidnapped. This is a rather curious detail, as it's a rather specific idea of her daughter's fate. Not that she had been murdered, gotten lost, or ran away from what was undoubtedly a broken home, specifically kidnapped. Martha's mother told police that on the night in question, that she wasn't at her friend's house until the mid-evening, that she was in fact attending a social gathering with her. She had apparently turned to her mother and in reference to visiting the friend's house said, I'm going over to a friend's house. I'll be back in five minutes. But Martha never returned. And by the time her mother had realized something was amiss, it was far too late. She searched and searched all night and into the wee hours of the following morning. But it was no good. And by the time 3 a.m. rolled around, Martha's mother was worried half to death. Police questioned pretty much everyone in the surrounding area and found that some of Martha's neighbors had some very interesting information regarding some suspicious activity in the neighborhood. Shortly after Martha was seen walking west down Carolyn Road that evening, a few members of the local community had seen a suspicious green van in the area, one that was seen to drive in roughly the same direction as Martha a short while after she left the social gathering. And what was most concerning was that not a single person who'd seen it was able to recognize the van as belonging to anyone in the community. And nor had they been able to record a license plate number, conflicting with his mother's account. Martha's brother David told the police that he and his sister were having dinner together that night, during the time just before she disappeared. He mentioned that she had gotten up from the table and walked out of the house, refusing to tell him where she was going before she climbed in the passenger seat of a black sedan. The police were forced to dismiss Martha's brother's claims in the face of other more consistent accounts. Yet, we're continuously flummoxed as to why the boy had given them such a strange fabricated version of events. Despite her mother's insistence that she had been kidnapped, Police originally assumed that Martha was a runaway due to the violent and volatile situation between her parents. But it only took a small amount of speculation and investigation for them to conclude that there was most likely some degree of foul play involved in her disappearance that it most likely ended in her murder. However, not a single suspect had been named as her kidnapper. And there have never been any arrests regarding her disappearance. Essentially, Martha walked off that night from somewhere and basically vanished from the face of the earth. A few days after she had initially disappeared, a handful of police officers scoured a wooded area behind the family's trailer for any sign of her. But again, nothing was found. Detectives also put a substantial amount of man-hours into searching for Martha's remains around the area where the Florida Memorial College once stood. But once again, nothing was found it confounded them. All the places where it was thought she may have either run off to or been dumped were completely devoid of clues. As a result, it was assumed that Martha's mother had been correct in her assertions and that Martha had indeed been kidnapped by someone who wasn't part of her extended family. Many missing person agencies in the United States still classify Martha's case as a non-family abduction to this day. Yet despite this, police say there is absolutely nothing to back this up, that there is no evidence of abduction and the green van theory. The one that neighbors claim they saw has never been substantiated. The one real discrepancy with the whole case is the fact that Martha's older brother David seems to have lied about what happened that night. As a result, for a while he actually became the closest thing the investigation ever had to a serious suspect based on the fact that there were obvious lies being told, and that his story seemed to change in its details on a few different occasions. As was previously mentioned, and David claims that he saw Martha get into a black sedan that he evening after they had dinner together, but he later changed his story to say that she had simply left to visit a local convenience store and then never returned home. Due to these inconsistencies, investigators suspected that although David might not have murdered her, there was definitely some information that he knew that he was not entirely forthcoming with. After all, he was only 14 years old at the time of her disappearance, and may not have been capable of cold-blooded murder. However, in the year 2000, when David was 29 years old, he approached local law enforcement with an outrageously shocking claim. 
He confessed to killing his sister and told officers that he had disposed of her body in a Kukaina mine located on Holmes Boulevard. Yet when the police searched the mine, there was no human remains to be found, nor any signs that anyone had been hurt or murdered there at all. Which meant that, despite his apparently full and frank confession, there was simply not enough evidence to charge David with his sister's murder. But then again, in 2009, David tried to convince the cops that it was in fact him that had murdered his sister, but changed the story from the version he had given nine years previously. This time around, David claimed that he and Martha had been playing together on the grounds of the then derelict Florida Memorial College building, having left their parents' trailer after a drunken argument had broken out over and over Cook Thanksgiving turkey. David said once they were tired of playing, they walked to a nearby convenience store to purchase refreshments. It was at the store that they began to argue over a $20 bill that David had nabbed from his mother's purse. When the argument peaked, Martha slapped David across the face, David, and told police that he had retaliated by shoving her which caused her to fall backwards in an awkward fashion, smashing her head on a piece of metal as she fell. David panicked, called for help. But after seeing that no one was around to help drag his sister's body back to the grounds of the old college, before burying her in a shallow grave. Once again, such a detailed confession warranted investigation, but just like the previous occasion, there was absolutely no evidence found to support it. But since the college buildings were demolished in the mid-90s, and the grounds excavated, there's every chance that her body could have been lost among the debris as it was being disposed of. However, when Martha's mother was asked if she believed that David had murdered her, she completely rebuked the idea. Even in the face of such an apparently frank confession, David's mother insists that David often told lies in order to get attention and double down on her claims that some kind of outsider was responsible for Martha's disappearance. Whether or not it was a result of direct pressure from his mother, David ended up retracting these previous confessions, admitting that he had completely fabricated the story so that law enforcement would give up the search for Martha and declare the case closed. He went on to admit that he'd suffered from intense emotional and mental problems. And it was these that made him outright lie about his involvement in his sister's disappearance, now denying that he had anything to do with it. As of November 2020, almost 25 years to the day since she disappeared, Martha Jean Lambert's disappearance remains completely unsolved, and no human remains had ever been discovered. There are only really two main theories regarding her disappearance, which revolve around the idea of abduction, or her brother accidentally killing her. But as previously stated, there is very little evidence to support either theory, and so logically, neither can be fully supported since there have been no arrests or charges. But that doesn't stop many from insisting that David's confession is so detailed and believable, that we can't simply dismiss his stories, even though they seem to shift in their details over time. Essentially, the one person whose story deviated may have just allowed a drip of information over time, unable to quite face the truth himself, then, overcome with guilt 15 years after the murder, he came forward to give a full and frank account of what happened that night. After he did so, David's mother not wanting to lose two children to the same incident, may well have convinced him to retract his confession so that he wouldn't end up rotting in prison. On top of that, the statute of limitations for manslaughter had expired by the time he made his first confession. Which raises the question. Is that simply a coincidence? Or was it a well-timed attempt to both clear his conscience while avoiding any actual punishment for his actions? Either way, it is pure speculation. And the case may truly be that we will never ever know what really happened to Martha Jean Lambert that Thanksgiving night, and it is a truly terrifying thought that a young girl can simply vanish from the face of the earth, with no closure for her friends, family, or society as a whole. In the early 20th century, Maria Zakharchenko escaped from her home country of Russia, feeling the bloodthirsty Bolsheviks who are in the process of turning their native land into the political wasteland that was the USSR. She escaped over the border to China, who at that time had yet to be consumed by communism as a temporary stopover on her way to the United States. However, it was in China that the superstitious Maria consulted a fortune teller, 
wishing to get an idea of what her journey had in store for her. The Chinese fortune teller gave Maria some very good news indeed, telling her that not only would she successfully make it to the United States, but that she would give birth to a daughter, whose beauty would become globally renowned, but the under all circumstances, she should avoid so-called dark waters. Then, after making it all the way to San Francisco, Maria gave birth to a daughter on July 20, 1938, naming her Natalia Nikolaev Nazarenko. Natalia would gain the fame that the fortune teller had predicted, but will be known by another name entirely. That name was Natalie Wood. Natalie's mother essentially groomed her for stardom from the time she learned to walk and talk. She sent her to singing, dancing and acting lessons training her to be a complete triple threat, before parading her around movie studios in the hopes that she would be discovered and thus fulfill her destiny. It was such an intensive experience that it verged on abusive. Natalie's mother was utterly ruthless and unforgiving, separating her from her sisters and even denying her medical assistance for injuries in the instance that this will only make her stronger. Maria paid close attention to the prophetic warnings of the fortune teller too and made effort to give Natalie a deeply ingrained fear of deep water. Yet despite her efforts, the fortune teller's predictions almost came true on the set of a movie called The Green Promise. During shooting, a young Natalie was set to run across a bridge that was set to collapse during a rainstorm, a bridge that just so happened to run over a pool of rough dark water. The director insisted that the timing would be just right. And although there would be an element of on-screen peril, she would be entirely safe, but terrifyingly enough. One of the set stuff happened to pull the collapse mechanism too early, and Natalie broke her wrist as she fell into the water. Her mother was distraught, believing she was about to see the prophecy of drowning come true, before her very eyes. But the set staff acting quickly helped Natalie pull herself to safety as she struggled to do so with a broken wrist. If she wasn't terrified of water beforehand, she certainly was then Marie refused to get her daughter any medical assistance for the broken wrist either, believing that an insistence on doing so would deter directors from hiring her in the future. The injury scarred her is so heavily that Natalie went on cyst on covering the scars with multiple bracelets for the rest of her life. Not only because she believed the wound was ugly, because it reminded her of one of the most traumatic incidents of her entire life so traumatic that she never ever learned to swim and was reported to have panic attacks whenever she tried to wash her hair. Despite her traumas, Natalie had a long and successful film career and will go on to wed fellow star Robert Wagner. They had a rocky relationship and naturally got divorced and remarried before having their one and only daughter, Natasha. Then during Thanksgiving weekend of 1981, Natalie Roberts and another movie star Christopher Walken were enjoying some rest and relaxation aboard Wagner's yacht, named The Splendor around the Catalina Island off the coast of California. Only one other person was with them. The boat's captain, a man named Dennis Davern. They spend the weekend shopping sunning themselves, sailing dining out and profusely drinking on the night of November 27, 1981, after yet another evening of heavy drinking. An argument between Natalie and Robert broke out. When that grew so intense that Natalie demanded that Captain Davern take her ashore on the small dinghy that was kept on board the Splendor. The power then spent the night in a hotel before returning to the boat the following morning when Natalie and Robert apparently talk things out and buried the hatchet. The following tonight, Robert Natalie, Captain Davern and Christopher Walken went ashore to dine at a restaurant called Doug's Harbor Reef. Here they continued their stint of heavy drinking, reportedly ordering two bottles of wine, two bottles of champagne, and numerous daiquiris, with one of the waiting staff reporting that they barely touched their food. The poor people were so intoxicated that the restaurant manager reportedly called harbor security to ensure that they made it back to the boat safely that night. According to Captain Davern, Robert Wagner, and Christopher Walken argued violently over politics, as well as the direction that Natalie's career should take. He has since stated that the argument grew so violent that one of the men threw an empty wine bottle at the other before Natalie had to get involved to separate the pair. 
The argument then shifts to one between Natalie and Robert with Natalie apparently telling Robert that she'd had enough before retiring to her room for the night at around 3.30 a.m. the next morning on November 29, of 1981. A ship-to-shore call was made from the Splendor, one in which Captain Davern reported to the U.S. Coast Guard that Natalie Wood was missing. A search begins, one that ended just a few hours later at around 8 a.m. when Natalie Wood's drowned body is found floating near the ship's inflatable dinghy. The very same one she had used to escape the boat just two days prior. She was wearing nothing but a nightgown, a pair of socks, and a jacket. An autopsy showed that she had a blood alcohol content of 0.14%, almost double the legal limit for driving. There was also evidence that she had taken a rather large amount of powerful painkillers in the time before her death. She was just 43 years old when she passed away. Amazingly, on the day she died, Robert Wagner is not intensively questioned by police. It's only a few days later that the three men who are on the boat that night are brought in for questioning and when they are each tells a suspiciously similar story that details the evening's events. As a result, Natalie's death was assumed to be nothing more than an accidental drowning. The nation was dumbstruck by such a horrible, unforeseeable tragedy and mourned in tandem with Robert Wagner, who went on to raise their two daughters as a single parent two daughters who were almost inconsolably distraught at the sudden death of their beloved mother. Natalie's death seemed to remain an open and shut case for an entire 30 years, until a shocking revelation turned public attention back on to the situation. Captain Dennis Davern The man who had been captaining the Splendor that night, broke his silence on the case and came forward to state that he had in fact lied to the investigating law enforcement. The nation was shocked to hear that the argument that night between Walken and Wagner had not actually been rooted in politics. With the suspicion that Walken had been secretly flirting with Natalie whenever Robert Wagner's back was turned. Davern said that the incident with one of the men throwing an empty bottle of wine at the other was actually Wagner, hurling the glass bottle at Walken in a rage as he barked out what he tried to do screw my wife. As was previously mentioned, the argument then shifted to one between Wagner and Natalie after Walking had retired to his room. But then when Natalie had tried to do the same and retire to bed, Robert Wagner had followed her to continue the argument. Then, some time later, Wagner stormed up to Captain Davern sweating and panicking and told him to turn off all the boat's lights and ignore all onshore calls that came into the boat. In the aftermath, Davern claimed that Wagner kept him confined to his quarters in order to prevent him from giving a statement to the police then held an impromptu meeting in which he ordered Walk-In and Davern to keep quiet about the arguments and to essentially give false statements to the police. In light of such statements, police reopened the investigation into Natalie Wood's death in the year 2012. A re-examining of the information gleaned from her autopsy had one coroner declaring that she had died as a result of drowning but also from other undetermined factors. Then in 2018, Wagner was officially named as a person of interest and Natalie Wood's death. Natalie's sister Lana came out and gave a media interview, stating that she believed Captain Devon's claims to be true, and had even confronted Wagner on the day of Natalie's funeral in an attempt to get him to reveal what had actually happened that night. This culminated in an appearance on the popular TV show, Dr. Phil, in which Lana and Davern publicly accused Wagner of being solely responsible for Natalie's death. However, Lana was keen to make it clear that she didn't believe it to be outright murder, and that she didn't believe Wagner ever really intended to kill his wife, but either became lost in his rage during a heat-of-the-moment decision, possibly denying Natalie help when she had fallen into the water while trying to lead the boat to go ashore, just as she had done just two nights previous. Despite the accusations from her sister, Natalie's two daughters, Natasha and Courtney stand by their father's versions of events, saying he had done all he could to preserve the mother's legacy. Courtney is not even Robert's biological daughter, but adores him so much that she has even taken on his surname, potentially is a sign of loyalty and respect. She personally believes and has publicly stated that Captain Davern is a fabricator, one who simply wishes to make a name for himself exploiting her mother's death for monetary gain and these claims do carry some weight to them. 
For example, Davern not only took 30 years to come forward with his accusations, but was also by his own admission, extremely drunk on the night in question. His story is apparently changed multiple times throughout the years, leaking seedy gossip to tabloid journalists the entire time. He had also written a book about the advance of the night in question, one which has been analyzed and debunked by numerous people who assert the Devon's version of events are extremely spurious. When asked about Devon's claims, Robert's biological daughter, Natasha has reportedly said he is somebody who I cannot even dignify with a response because he's so undignified. As for Christopher Walken, the only other person aboard the Splendor that evening. He hasn't spoken much at all about the incident, keeping suspiciously quiet over the years. When asked about how he felt regarding the reopening of the case, he reportedly said I don't know, having previously said that he firmly believed Natalie's death to be a tragic accident. And conclusion, it's not entirely out of the question that an extremely intoxicated Natalie might have tried to use the very same dinghy she had used a few nights previous. And doing so she could have simply fallen into the water and drowned while the other people on board were either too drunk to respond to her cries, or simply below deck and unable to hear her entirely. Yet it's also scarily feasible that a jealous husband had discovered her infidelities, either perceived a real thrown her into the sea in a rage, and simply used his influence or outright threats to cover up the murder. It has been 39 years since Natalie's tragic death, and we are still no closer to knowing the entire truth as to what happened to her that night. And it's not only her family and friends that deserve concrete answers, but society as a whole. Have we had a murderer walking among the Hollywood elite for the past 40 years or so? Or has an innocent man been subjected to a campaign of slander when he should have been given room to heal? Whatever happened that Thanksgiving weekend, one thing is painfully clear that the dark prophecy told to Maria Zakarenko by the Chinese fortune teller in the early 20th century, did actually come true. And it was indeed dark waters that became the undoing of the young woman who came to be known to the world as Natalie Wood.